and welcome to our Mission Wealth Year End Family Legacy and Philanthropic Considerations Client Event. My name is Sarah Clark, and I am Mission Wealth's Director of Client Relationships. I partner closely with our Wealth Advisors and our Wealth Advisor Associates to deliver an excellent client experience. Today, I am joined by my two colleagues, Andrew Kulha and Amanda Thomas. Andrew serves as our Director of Estate Strategy, where he provides comprehensive estate planning and legacy solutions to our clients, including wealth transfer, asset structuring, and trust administration. As a former trust and estate attorney and current certified financial planner, Andrew is well-versed in trust and estate planning. Amanda serves as our Director of Philanthropic Strategy and is also a certified financial planner. Amanda guides and educates our clients on formulating effective philanthropic plans and implementing tax efficient gifting strategies. Before we get started, thank you for sending in a number of impactful questions ahead of our discussion today. We are looking forward to answering many of these questions throughout our conversation. Our objective is to help our clients and prospects better understand how to approach family legacy planning for your estate plan and how to implement actionable ideas for incorporating philanthropy into your legacy planning. To begin, Andrew, may we start with you. How should our clients be thinking about legacy planning and its importance? Well, great question, Sarah. And uh, want to dive into that. Before we get started, there's a poll question I'd like to have pulled up here. I just want everyone to think about this question. It's, have you ever, have you or created a legacy plan or charitable giving plan? Uh, so make sure you answer the question in the poll here. But the question is on legacy planning. What is that? Why is it important? And legacy planning is different from estate. Estate planning is we're going to get our documents in place. We know who we're going to give things to. Great. You've got our, everything set up. Legacy planning is taking that further. It's thinking about how are we going to protect who's in our in our life? How are we going to provide for them and preserve what we've built and what's important to us? And also how we're going to empower those people and causes that are important to us uh, for the future. How are we going to set them up for success? So we want to take it a bit further. It's about going deeper than just the basics of a plan. And here's who's going to get what to how are we going to set this up for even better success into the future? It looks like we've got the, the answers back, the results back from the poll. We got 27% you say yes, 73% say no, which actually lines up right with many different uh, polls that are out there and statistics that are out there on the number of Americans who actually have a plan in place. About 67% of Americans don't have an estate plan out there. So what today we're trying to focus on and what we want to set everyone up for is that success. We don't want you to be part of that 67%. We want you to be part of the 33 uh, so that's what legacy planning is. And that's what we're going to talk about more today. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Amanda, do you have anything else you would like to add? Sorry about that. I was going to go a little bit into the philanthropy. Thank you. So this is a chart showing the growth in philanthropy in America. I mean, amazingly, you can see that it continues to grow even during the pandemic, uh, people were giving. And the biggest number is the one on the right where the highest percentage of giving is done by individuals. People think about companies, foundations and such, but it's really you, our clients who are giving. And a couple of statistics, Fidelity Charitable, who we work with closely, um, said they saw a 13% growth in um, grants in 2020. And it also was a 41% increase before based on pre-pandemic numbers. So giving is growing rapidly. Uh, foundations are also being tracked based on some statistics. They are giving larger grants. They're giving um, more grants. And foundations, and many of you may not know, have to give 5% of their um, foundation away every year. And on average, they're actually giving away 6.6. .6. So I are seeing growth in not only individuals, but also foundations. And another last statistic is uh, Fidelity Charitable did a survey and 74% of millennials between 25 and 40 years of age say they are philanthropic. 
whereas 35% of baby boomers are. So the next generation is thinking about giving, they think they're giving and they're getting ready to give more. So we're all ready for them. Great, thank you, Amanda. Now that we have defined legacy planning and provided a general overview of philanthropic giving in the US, I think it would be beneficial to discuss a few ideas that our clients can implement by the end of the year. Amanda, what are some immediate ways clients can engage in charitable gifting strategies that are both tax effective and also will create a lasting impact on our clients' philanthropic goals? So the Donor Advised Fund, um, and there's a screen there on what is probably, the, it is the fastest growing charitable vehicle out there. Um, again, statistics I love, they really speak a lot that uh, again, uh, National Philanthropic uh, Trust said that there were 290,000 donor advised funds in 2016. In 2020, there were over a million. So we are constantly opening these up for clients. They're a wonderful tool. So let me walk you through very briefly how they work. You are the donor and you basically contribute cash, appreciated securities. You can do real estate, partial interest in real estate, private stock, Bitcoin, anything that's appreciated is really the, the most, um, the best asset to transfer into a donor advised fund. Donor advised fund is an account you open up at various institutions, Schwab Charitable, Fidelity Charitable, Community Foundations, a lot of them support these types of accounts. Once the asset goes in there, that is your tax deduction. That's what you give your CPA, whatever the value of that asset was when it went in there and got liquidated, that's your tax deduction. Then on the far right, you have unlimited time to give it away. And that's the beauty of these is that you can time a donation in a year that you might have higher income. Maybe you're selling a company, maybe you're retiring, the next year you won't have high income. So a lot of people time these and they don't have want to give the money all the way at once, but they want to get the tax deduction. So that's what donor advice fund is. Um, again, I want to, uh, one um, item that's very interesting that has been a big uh, asset to donate, Bitcoin. Fidelity Charitable saw a um, huge 12-fold uh, increase in cryptocurrency being donated. So it's not the only asset, but just know there are other items besides cash, appreciated stock, those kind of things that go into donor advice funds. Thank you. And a donor advice fund, Amanda, can, is that all I have to use? Can I still gift outright? What can I do uh, on that? Yeah, you can always gift um, cash to a charity, but it really, when you run it through a donor advice fund, it's so much more efficient. Um, you have one place to go to. You can see all your gifts. You can revisit it every year. Um, it also is a great way to do um, bunching, which is kind of the next topic we're going to. Or if you want to time your donations and get the most tax impact, I have an example here. And by the way, this is on a website. It's at the very bottom there. SchwabCharitable.org has a great calculator. So the assumption here was just um, married filing jointly. I just picked that. $250,000 combined income. $10,000 a year that you might give normally to charities. And $12,000 might be your other, meaning um, mortgage interest <coughs> and state income taxes. And by the way, state income taxes are limited to 10,000 a year. So that's a number that's kind of a hard number. Um, in this case, in the first column there, this person did not do bunching. And bunching is when you try to uh, put multiple years of donations into one year. In this case, they just gave $10,000. They already have, you'll notice in the bottom there, there's a highlighted standard deduction. This couple has a $27,000 standard deduction. So their 10,000 charitable donation, plus this other 12,000 we see in the left adds up to 22,000. So they are not able to get the benefit of this charitable deduction because they get to use the higher of the two, either standard deduction or charity plus mortgage plus um, other deductions. So in this case, first column, they didn't really get the benefit of their charitable deduction. In the second column, they did two years. So instead of doing 10,000, they just double it up and did 20. Now that plus the other um, 12,000 pushes them to 32,000. 
Now they're just a little bit over that 27,700 standard deduction. Okay, so they got a little bit of a benefit from that. The third column is, let's just do three years of donations, but do it in one year, meaning it's gonna be covering my next three years of donations. So they did 30,000. Now they're above, way above the standard deduction because they have 30,000 charitable and another 12,000 other. Now they're way above that and look at the tax savings. So the, the, the begin, the, really the key here is to try to bunch your donations in one year and then you don't have to give for a couple of years. So it gives you a wonderful tax benefit um, for bunching. So again, this calculator here, we'll be sending that out later, but that's a great way just to kind of see if you can benefit from it. Of course, as tax um, clients of ours come to us and ask these questions, we're able to do that analysis for them too. And then, oh, one other question I had um, from um, a prior, uh, somebody who wrote in about donating internationally. That's a really a challenge. Um, if you have a nonprofit that has an American arm, you know, has a, an American based nonprofit, that's great. You can donate through them. Otherwise, you have to go through an intermediary company and they will vet this nonprofit for you. But I'll tell you, it can be expensive um, to do that. Um, you can use maybe your Fidelity Charitable or Schwab Charitable, your community foundation, but it is a challenge and they do charge for that. If it's a large enough donation, they're going to charge, but they have to vet that nonprofit. It has to be under the uh, 501c3 rules for charities for the US. So you can't automatically assume international nonprofits meet those guidelines. So those are one of the things that um, can be done. And then um, the next one I have is giving to uh, the uh, qualified charitable distributions. So those are my top three, donor advised funds, bunching and qualified charitable donor distributions. So in this case, the client in the first column has an income of 122,000. That includes 80,000 of like other income, and he's over his required minimum distribution age for his IRA, so he has to take 42,683 of his, they call it RMD, required minimum distribution. So in this case, he got 122,000, of which includes his RMD, then he turned around and wrote a check to charities, and then he got the deduction of 42,000, so his taxable income is now at 80. The alternative is instead of taking his RMD as income, he instead gifts his RMDs to multiple charities. It's very easy to do. You let your custodian know, Fidelity, Charitable, whoever, please send a check from my IRA directly to the charity. And so he did that for all of his RMD. He actually got to use his standard deduction, which is 15,700, because he's over 65 and such. So he dropped his taxable income. So basically when you give money to charity out of your IRAs, it doesn't count as taxable income. So in this case, he's able to lower his taxable income and obviously have tax savings. So it's a very common um, strategy, but a lot of people haven't seen it enough and you need to be over 70 and a half and you can do up to $100,000 of your RMD to charities. So and that's gonna be indexed for inflation. But those are the three um, strategies that are top of mind for us and very easy ones you can ask your um, advisor about. Excellent, thank you, Amanda. I think it's really helpful to define and explain donor advised funds, bunching and qualified charitable distributions. Andrew, we also received a few questions from clients and prospects regarding estate planning techniques, including trusts and gifting. Would you like to elaborate on some of our recommended strategies? Yeah, be glad to. So just pulling it back from the philanthropic side. So most folks say, you know, I want to take care of family members. I want to give to them. I want to take care of them. What can I do? Uh, and the, the main one that we all know and can do is you can pay money to someone directly. You can gift them money. Uh, there are certain limits of what you're allowed to do. There's what's called your annual exclusion amount. And this is an amount that each person, every one of us can give this amount to any number of people. And you don't have to start thinking about your gift tax and estate tax exemption. So if that number for 2023 is $17,000. I could give $17,000 to Amanda, to Sarah, uh, to everybody else on this call, and I wouldn't have to go file a gift tax return with the IRS. 
I'm sorry, I can't give everyone on this call $17,000. I hope you weren't all expecting that. Next year, it's going to increase to $18,000 with inflation. So we're going to go from 17 to 18. If you're married, you can double that. So husband can give 17,000, 17, wife can give 17,000. You can double that. So now you get 34,000 to any number of people that you want to give to. That's the first level. The next level is when you decide, well, maybe I want to do a little more than that. You can do more than that. It's just now you're going to have to start chewing into what's called your lifetime unified credit exemption. So you, me, everybody on this call can give up to $12.92 million to any uh, to, to anyone. That's a total that you can give to anyone during your life or at death before you have to start paying estate and gift taxes. That's the federal level. There are rules for each state. We're going to focus on the federal level here today. So if I give $17,001 to somebody, I have to go use $1 of that $12.92 million that I'm allowed to do. I have to file a gift tax return. I don't owe any taxes on that gift. It's just something to keep in mind because there are planning techniques around that. But you don't have to just do outright gifts. There are things like trusts that you can do uh, and set things up in a way that's more structured. And we'll get more into that in a moment on how do we be more structured with our giving uh, as that relates to our plan. Uh, that we'll, we'll get into that piece more. There's two other exceptions to that exclusion I mentioned earlier, so that $17,000 figure. Uh, there are, you can, you can pay directly to providers for qualified medical expenses and for educational expenses. So if you have someone that you know that's getting a required medical treatment, you could pay that provider directly for them if you wanted to take care of them. And that doesn't count towards that $17,000 figure. Uh, if you are paying for tuition, you can do that, pay directly to the provider, not to that person, to the provider, and that doesn't count towards that $17,000 figure. But those are kind of the, the, the basic gift ways if we're not going to be going about it in a structured manner. So I'll, we'll talk more on that in a moment. Slide. Many of our clients are charitably inclined, but may not know where to start to identify the appropriate charities and causes that align with their beliefs and objectives. Amanda, how would you recommend a client research charities and causes that are well aligned with their beliefs and desired philanthropic goals? Great question. I actually get that asked a lot. So I my go-to is Schwab Charitable and Fidelity Charitable. They have um, websites um, of their own, separate from the uh, custodian websites. They're both very reputable, the largest in the country. And they have a research tool. So they have a page that lists multiple websites that you can research nonprofits. A couple of them I'll name are GuideStar. GuideStar will actually show you the tax return for these charities. Very interesting to dive in to see what their fundraising is, how much they're paying their director, how much cash they have on hand, some of the basics. You want to make sure that charity is going to be around for a long time and that they're not really using so much of their donations towards their overhead versus what they're giving away to the causes. Um, another one is Charity Watch. They actually rank charities and they have certain criteria. So it's not always perfect, but it is some a guideline. If something is at the bottom of the list, maybe questioning some of their, their, their numbers in there, but if they're top rated, um, I know there's one in Santa Barbara here that basically raises all their money for their overhead. So every, they do it separately and every dollar you donate goes directly to their cause. It's a wonderful model. So they are very highly rated. So it's something to do. You can do, um, there's a couple other websites on there. That's a great place to start. So we'll be sending links out to that later. Uh, well, now I would like to transition to discuss longer term trends and techniques in philanthropy and estate planning. Earlier, Amanda discussed donor advised funds. And in addition to donor advised funds, we partner with families who have established private foundations. It would be helpful, Amanda, for you to share how donor advised funds compare and contrast to private foundations. Great. So we have a slide here. It's just a uh, compare and contrast. And um, the private foundation, both and the donor, donor advised fund is DAF. So that's what that means. And basically, you get your tax deduction immediately. So they're the same. <clears throat> so the limitation AGI is adjusted gross income. So that looks at your income. That's an adjusted number. You'll see that in your tax return. And you can only get the tax deduction that year for up to 30% for private foundation and 60% for DAS for cash. 
So you're not, you're not able to say, I made a million dollars, I gave a million dollars, zero taxes. They limit how much you can deduct of your income. Um, for long-term capital gain property, which is the next item, and that could be like appreciated stocks, private foundations have a less um, a lesser number of 20% of your adjusted gross income. Donor advised funds can do 30%. So if you made $100,000, you can deduct up to um, $30,000 of your income with a charitable donation. So that's kind of the number it looks at. Now, ease of creation. Um, foundations aren't simple. Anybody out there who has one will find there's some legal expenses when you start them up, um, applications to the IRS, state entity, startup costs. So it's not something you want to do for small amounts. Typically, I'm seeing at least five million or more for foundations. Um, donor advice funds, as simple as you can get. You literally go online to whatever um, custodian you choose, Fidelity Charitable, Schwab Charitable, um, your community foundation. They literally can be opened almost within an hour. I've had a client who did it on New Year's Eve at four o'clock and we were able to get money into her account as a tax donation. It tells you how quickly it can happen. Ongoing costs. Yes, foundations do have costs. Again, legal, the tax returns, administrative fees. You might have people you've hired within the foundation. You have to deal with that. That is one benefit you can get. You can hire people, family within your foundation. Um, donor advised funds. There are literally minimal costs. So for example, I think they charge about 0.6% at Fidelity and Schwab for the cost of holding a donor advised fund. And then you have investments that can be invested in, uh, but it's pretty minor and, the, <clears throat> and they only charge I think 0.6 or $100, whichever is greater. And they're the ones that you basically go into and you say, please send checks out to all these charities. They do all the work for you. It's all online. So, I mean, I have one myself. I love them. Most of our clients are opening them up. So I'm just a big proponent of donor advised funds. Um, foundations, um, they do have to do a 5% distribution as a requirement. Maybe that sounds easy. Yeah, you know, give it away 5%, but sometimes you may not have an, any charities in mind or don't want to give 5%. And that's where the donor advised fund says, you have a minimal amount you have to send out. Um, right now, I believe Fidelity Charitable, it's $50 every two years. That's it. Otherwise, there is no time limit on giving the money out. So you might save it for later. Um, there's another model where you say, you know, I might want to leave this donor advice fund to some charities when I die, but I don't want to get lump sums to them. So you can have it set up with a model called a legacy or endowment. You can see when I pass away, I'd like X dollars to be sent out to these multiple charities over multiple years. So they can basically kind of set up a legacy plan for you. So that can be set up a donor advised fund. Um, there are some disclosure requirements for private foundations, zero for donor advised funds. If you have a contribution into it, that's the only thing that's a tax document. You want to have that for your CPA. Um, anonymity, private foundations, they know where the money's coming from. You can't you know, hide from that. So you don't want to be disclosed that you're giving money. There's no way around that. Donor advice fund, you can just check a box and say, please make this anonymous. The charity will get the check and it will just say, so -and -so, a check was sent to you for X dollars and they'd like to remain anonymous. So that way you don't get solicitations. You might not get things in the mail. So there's some pros and cons. I will close this in saying, in conversation with some of our uh, partners, they are finding that a lot of people are unwinding private foundations. They're just finding they're, they're complex, they're time consuming. Um, the kids may not want to be engaged in it, so the next generation doesn't want to continue that. So you can unwind a foundation into a donor advice fund, and that's happening a lot. So donor advice funds seem to be the most um, popular model out there now, and they're very easy to open, and I, we just um, use them all the time for our clients. This comparison chart is really helpful, Amanda. Are there any other long-term funding ideas and approaches that clients should consider? Yeah, so I am really finding more and more ways that donor advice funds um, are, are really a tool that simplifies your giving. So for example, if you have an IRA and you wanted to go to charity or multiple charities, you, let's say you leave three charities, A, B, and C. When you pass away, each charity now has to open up an inherited IRA at wherever you had your IRA, and then they have to have their board members open accounts and, and you know do all that paperwork. 
if you just named your donor advised fund as your beneficiary of your IRA, basically the IRA goes to the donor advised fund. If you name the charities there, they get a check. So it's great for IRAs, 401ks, 403bs. It can be basically a beneficiary in any retirement account. It can also be a beneficiary in your trust. So for example, if you say, I'd like to leave $100,000 to, to these charities um, upon my death, every time you have to change, you want to change your charity, you have to go back to your attorney and change those charities, you spend whatever hourly rate to change those charities. So instead of that, just say, I leave $100,000 to my donor advice fund, and you name it in there the Fidelity, Charitable, Schwab, whatever. And then when you pass away, the 100,000 goes to your donor advice fund and you have instructions in that that tell how it's being distributed. And you can change that online. So you don't have to go back to your attorney every time. Um, so those are two of the big ones that I see. Um, and let me think, also you leave your kids as beneficiaries on these donor advice funds. What a great way to leave a legacy, right? Let's say I leave my, donor advice fund, you name them as successors. So they now step into your shoes and take over what's left in your donor advice fund, and they now can give it away over their lifetime. So those are really some of the tools that I'm seeing here um, that are very popular with donor advice funds and how, how easy they are to do. And um, again, your advisors are very versed in that, and I'm always happy to help. Transitioning back to you, Andrew, what are other long-term trust and estate ideas for philanthropic planning and estate planning? We had a few client questions regarding family fairness and treating family members equitably. So Andrew, would you like to discuss further? Yeah, I mean, those are great questions again. And wanting to treat the family fairly, wanting to have plans in place, all that relates back to we need to have some kind of structure around what we're doing. Uh, so we kind of talked to the first, you know, we can do these one-offs. We're going to put money in the donor advised fund. We're going to do a qualified charitable distribution. We're going to do some outright gifts. But if we really want to make sure we're taking care of people, we're taking care of our plan, we have something in place, we do need to start to be more structured. So that's where wills and trusts start to come into play. Uh, we want to write out what our rules are going to be. We want to talk about who we want to get what. Maybe we divide certain percentages up differently based on Say you have two children, maybe one of them has kids, one of them has no plans to have kids, and you want to make sure that those grandkids are taken care of as well a little bit more. You need to write all that out, and it needs to be in the plan. It needs to be in that will or in your trust uh, so that your rules are what's going to happen and not, if you don't have anything, the state's rules are what's going to happen. And people are going to be treated fairly, but it may not be the way you want them to be. Uh, so we're talking a little bit about structure here. We'll go more into state planning and general concepts and things like that in another webinar. Today, we're going to keep it more focused on the, the, the legacy planning and philanthropic piece. So one thing we hear a lot of times about when we're trying to balance, we want to take care of the family, we want to take care of people. We also want to be charitably inclined. We want to take care of those causes that are right for us. I'm not ready to give up all those assets today uh, to charity. I'm, maybe I don't want them all to go to a charity at my death. I want somebody to still benefit from it. I want to still have the use of it. So there's two trusts we can we can look at that actually will do a blend of that, uh, where we can benefit charity at some point and we can benefit people at another point. Uh, so I'll start with what's called a charitable remainder trust. And I'm going to pull up a diagram here. A charitable remainder trust is an irrevocable trust that you would set up. You're the grantor in this situation. You put initial seed money into this charitable remainder trust. For, for most folks, this trust doesn't start to make sense. It's not really economical unless you're thinking about a million dollars or more really to go into a trust like this because there are tax reporting requirements. There are legal costs to get this set up. Similar to that foundation, it's not as administratively burdensome, but there are some burdens to get this set up. You, you set up that charitable remainder trust. You immediately get a tax deduction back on your tax return for uh, for what you put in there based on a few factors. And I'll go into the, show you the math on how this works in just a moment. So you set up that trust. You also set on there, who's going to be the income beneficiary? Who's going to get a set dollar figure each year? And that's going to be, if we were to set up a charitable remainder annuity trust or a CRAT, or you can say, I want someone, this income beneficiary to get a percent of assets each year. 
and then it's called a charitable remainder unit trust. You're doing that percent, and that's what we see most people do. You're going to set it at as low as 5% of the trust balance annually or as high as 50%. For most tests that the IRS has out there, you should keep that percentage below 10% for this trust to be able to pass those tests and make it to the end. So you set that figure in there, you set who the income beneficiary is. That can be yourself. You can bring those dollars back to yourself uh, over time. You also set a term for that trust for how long it's gonna last. It can be as long as your life. If you're gonna set it for a term of years, you can go up to 20 years. So once you set all of those, the trust is funded, you put assets in there, it's a great tool for if you have highly appreciated assets, you can put those in there, sell them and immediately diversify and also not immediately realize the capital gains. You'll realize them over time and the income that comes out, but you can avoid having that immediate income tax hit uh, to your on your on your 1040. As that trust goes along, you'll receive that income at the end of its term, whoever, whatever you set as that measuring term uh, on it. Whatever's left in this trust is going to go to charity. You can go to your donor advised fund, so you can change out those charities at any time just by going online, or you could name set charities. This is why it's called a remainder trust, because the remainder at the end goes to charity. So here's how the math works on this. Because it's the holidays, we're going to talk about a donor named Mr. Grinch. So Mr. Grinch has a change of heart and wants to go put a million dollars into a charitable remainder unit trust. Mr. Grinch is 65 years old, so according to the IRS, he has a life expectancy of 24.4 years. He's going to set this trust to last for his lifetime. He's going to be the income beneficiary on it. Before we get into the deduction, we look at the IRS has a, a, a rate they set every month called the 75-20 rate, and that's where we're going to pull. We're going to use that figure plus the life expectancy plus the amount that goes into this trust uh, for determining the charitable deduction. So you'll see there's two columns here, a 5% income payout annually or a 7% income payout annually. In this 5%, you get a higher deduction. You get four, Mr. Grinch gets a $435,000 charitable deduction the year he funds this. He may not have all the, enough income each year to offset because of AGI limitations. And if so, that carries forward for up to five years. So he's got time to use this deduction if he can't in year one. But he can also, maybe he's going to do some Roth conversion or something like that. Charitable deduction can offset that Roth conversion. Each year, he's going to get 50000 in income. But because this trust here is growing at 7%, the income amount is going to go up each year a little bit for him. So he's going to get 5% of the balance of the trust each year. Over his lifetime, assuming he lives his 24 years, he's going to get $1.5 million in income back. So he still retains benefit of this million dollars of assets. He gets another 500000 of income over time as well. Charity at the end is going to get $1.6 million because he's not drawing the entire growth each year out of the trust here. Conversely, say he does that 7% version, he gets a little bit less of a charitable deduction because charity is going to get less at the end. That's what part of the calculation is based on. He's going to get a flat $70,000 every year because every dollar of growth is coming back out in this calculation. So he's going to get $1.7 million of income still, still benefiting from that million dollars over time, also benefiting charity at the end. A million dollars at the end of this trust term goes to charity. So that's a charitable remainder trust. We can flip it around, though. Some people say, well, maybe I want to benefit charity during my lifetime, see how that impacts them. And then I want to leave it to individuals, family members at the end of that trust. So there's something called a charitable lead trust, so just as the remainder trust, the remainder went to charity. In this one, the charity leads. Grantor sets up this trust. Again, it's an irrevocable trust. They fund it with a certain dollar amount. Again, million dollars is about kind of that mark where this starts to make sense. There are two flavors of this trust, though. One where you, the, the donor, can get a tax deduction when it is set up. And one where the trust gets a tax deduction when it is set up and then every year thereon. The difference is when you do the version where the trust gets the, the, the tax deduction, the charitable deduction, it's a little bit more tax efficient for transfer tax purposes, for estate tax purposes down the line. So we're not going to go into that nuance here today, but that's something, if this is something that you're interested in, we can talk further on why, which one makes sense for you. The charity is going to get a set amount each year. Uh, you can set it as a dollar figure. You can set it as a percent figure. You also have more, you can be a bit more nuanced with this and actually change the amount that they get each year, as long as it equals a certain figure in a present value calculation. We can talk more about that uh, when at another time as well. 
But the idea is charity is going to get funds each year and it's going to benefit them. Whatever's left at the end, at the end of that trust term, uh, is going to go on to those beneficiaries that you name. It can also go on to a further trust for those beneficiaries. There's lots of ways we can tailor this. Again, the distinction is in our charitable remainder, charity gets it at the end. In a charitable lead, charity gets it at the front side uh, during the lifetime. So those are those two specifically focused charitable trusts that exist out there that are kind of a blend of, I don't want to give everything out right today. I want to still have benefit, but I do want to give something to charity at some point. Great. Well, switching gears a bit, as you may be aware or have seen or read in the news, there are anticipated estate and tax legislative changes set to occur in 2026. Andrew, what changes can clients expect to see in 2026? And what should clients be thinking about from a planning perspective between now and then? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's a lot to this. Uh, we could do an entire webinar on what's coming with the sun. It's called the tax law sunset. So at the end of 2025, the Tax Cuts and Job Act is going to sunset. Those provisions that changed the tax code in 2025, I'm sorry, in 2017 will sunset. So on January 1, 2026, we're going to see a lot of changes in the tax code. Uh, so on the tax bracket side, so on the income tax side, a lot of those brackets are going to raise in rate. Uh, so the 22% bracket is going to come the 25% bracket. The 24% bracket is going to become the 28% bracket. So we're all going to be paying a little bit more in taxes beginning in 2026. So this does present an opportunity. If, if depending on the bracket you're in now, it makes sense to do Roth conversion right now. If you are able to, because you're going to pay a little bit less in taxes. You have lower, smaller uh, tax rates. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of calculus in that. That's coming. The other piece of it is, I mentioned earlier that you've got $12.92 million that you can give away uh, each year. Uh, I'm sorry, not each year, uh, during your life or at death. So it's your lifetime unified credit exemption. That number is going to get chopped in half. So we're going to go from next year, it's going to be 13.6. We're going to go back to, we estimate probably $7 million in exemption on the federal side for the estate tax for everybody. So that means for folks that are higher net worth, ultra high net worth, you might not be in a taxable estate situation today. You could go to bed on 1231, not owing estate taxes to on 1126, something were to happen to you, you would. So there are planning opportunities to take advantage of that expanded exemption. There are things to be thinking about with that expanded exemption. Uh, talk with your advisor. We'll work with you all on mapping out those scenarios and solutions that are there so that you can see, hey, if I were to do X, Y, and Z, this is how it impacts me from a bottom line figure. Uh, most folks, we are talking about charity. Most folks don't want the IRS included as the charity in their plan, uh, and we'll do our best to avoid that where we can. Thank you. Um, there are readily apparent estate and tax planning implications here, so it's great that we're looking to be proactive with our clients. Yeah. Balancing charitable giving with a client's broader financial plan and estate plan can be challenging. So what advice do you have for families in this regard? So we were talking about charities a minute ago. Um, what we do at Mission Wealth is we run an annual cash flow analysis for our clients. And what I did, I was an advisor for many years. I throw in multiple goals of what if. So what if I had a long-term care event? What if I want to gift to my grand new grandkids, pay for colleges or whatever your living expenses are? We, put all those goals in there. And then we say, okay, you're right. You have a great level of success um, statistically that you'll have plenty of money. Then I run another scenario and say, well, how much more do I have? Can I give, can I spend? So we'll run a maximum spending scenario. And the difference between what you currently have as your goals and that maximum is what's available for you to either give to family or to charities. Because I always want to make sure our clients are put the map, basically the oxygen mask in themselves first. Make sure all of your expected goals are being met. Maybe a little cushion. And then what's left over is what you um, safely can take as a withdrawal, whether it's to charity or family. So that's what we do um, within our analysis for our clients. And I believe now, Andrew, we have a poll question. Yeah, so I think where we're going to we're going to go from here now as we talked a bit about some strategies and things like that. But where this comes back to is, you know, 
how do we involve the family in this? And how do we have these conversations? What do we talk about? So we've got a pull up here is, you know, just put an answer. How many of you have had legacy conversations with your family or with your beneficiaries? About, Here's what we want to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Here's how the plan works. And as those, those results are coming in, um, uh, I think we might pivot to the next section here, right, Sarah? Yes, that would be great. So it's worth noting that family conversations regarding legacy planning and values can be difficult to navigate. So how would you recommend a family begin a conversation regarding their family values? That's, that's a great question. And the results look really look very balanced. Uh, we're doing a good job out there of having these conversations with our family. 51% of you said yes, 49% said no. So we're right at 50-50. So that's good. Uh, we are talking about these things out there. Uh, and that's what this comes back to is, you know, when, when we're thinking about these goals we talk about, hey, you know, I want to do this, the, these charitable gifts through a donor advised fund, or I want to go do a QCD, or I want to set up a, a, a charitable remainder trust. At the other day, we can't effectively accomplish what our goals are behind these, these, these moves if we don't have an understanding of why we are doing them. So we need to make sure that everything is coordinating together, uh, in moving in the same direction. But it can't just be the, the financial component that's working, that we're looking at. We have to be thinking about everything. So when when we think about wealth, we wanna, we wanna think about more than just the financial figure. There's more to this if we're trying to set up this transition for success down the line. Uh, there's a statistic out there where uh, for families where we're passing on wealth from one generation to the next, if there haven't been conversations, if there haven't been these values conversations and education, 70% of the time, that money is all gone by the first generation. 90% of the time, it's all gone by the second generation. So it's really important that we go into these, we, we go in and have these conversations with our family, but it can't just be about, again, the numbers. Uh, and many times we don't want to talk about the numbers because we want to keep that private. And there's no right or wrong uh, answer behind that piece of it. What I want to talk about is how do we set this up for success? How do we set up these transitions for success? And I'm going to bring up here, uh, it's, it's a concept called family capital. So this is where we look at more than just the financial wealth. We have to look at, we have to look at what makes our family our family. If you're to just sit, this isn't a poll question, but maybe some homework. If you're to just sit and think, what does it mean to be a, what is my, your last name? So for me, it'd be, what does it mean to be a Kula? What does it mean to be a Thomas? What does it mean to be a Clark? Um, think about what goes into that. And most times you're not going to come back to say, well, it's because what it means to be that is I have X amount of dollars in an investment account. It's going to be we're hard workers. We are tenacious. We are we give back to our community. So part of this is defining what your family mission statement is, what your family values are. And that's where we look at some of these different things, because that's going to help you define that total family capital. Uh, we look at the financial capital, of course, that is a part of it. How are we using our finances? What do they look like? How do we set that up for success? Who are the people in our family? How are we setting them up for success? What does it mean to be those people? How are we helping all of, all of them? How are we growing intellectually? Are we continuing education? Are we supporting the education of family members? Are we supporting education in our community as a whole? Because that's going to tie into how we're using our intellect to help our society that we're a part of. How are we giving back? How are we participating in our community? How are we being social? What are we doing in our networks? How are we living up to our morals? What does our family mean? What is our spiritual capital that we've got here? All this ties together into this family capital. And we have to work on that first before we can then go have those bigger conversations with the family about what that means and start to involve them. Because we do want to involve them in, 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 in all of this, in this planning to make sure that our legacy looks right. And it works right and is set up for success in the future. So, Amanda, I know there's a a tool out there for involving family members that you that you really like. It's called the Gift for Giving. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about that some more? Sure. I don't think people realize when you have. I'm back to my donor advised fund um, soapbox here, but they're a wonderful tool. So a lot of people don't realize it's. Let's say the parent wants to fund their donor advised fund with some appreciated stock. They can actually transfer some of their donor advice fund money to their children's donor advice fund. Children just open one up and they can transfer money 
but it goes from donor advised fund to donor advised fund. And then let them watch the kids give that money away. Let them start learning how to give money away. Um, one of the easiest tools, if you don't want the kids to open up a donor advised fund, in Fidelity Charitable has what's called a gift for giving. Gift and the number for giving. And what you can do is you basically get the person's email. Let's say their son is a teenager and they want to teach them a little bit about giving. They, it basically allows you to send an email to your son. It says, your parents have just gifted you X dollars. Now you, son, go on the website and you now can give it away and your wishes. Parents don't see how the son gives it away, but basically they've given them part of their donor advice fund. It allows them to start learning how to give money away. So it might be something you do every Christmas, maybe part of their Christmas gift, and uh, let them start learning how to look at charities and research and do what they want to do and get some practice in that. So when someday they may want to do some charitable gifting, they've got some experience on that. So I love that tool. Yeah, that's it's a great tool. And I've seen it work with the family where there's uh, the, the matriarch of the family. She tells the grandkids every year, I'm going to give you all X amount of dollars. 2000 is going to go to you outright. And then I'm going to match that in my donor advice fund. And then we're all going to get together and I want you guys to present on the charity that you want to give those dollars to. And it's a way that they can all get together. They can talk about what's important to them and share that. And it's a fun little thing that they can do each year uh, to give those, those, those funds to the causes that they want to. But it's all something where they can all come together and do it as the family. Um, what's important in all this, too, is that when we are able to do these conversations and define our family, what we mean, what it means, um, we're able to build up an institutional knowledge that's going to carry this plan on for success throughout the generations. And this is where you can also involve your advisor as part of these conversations, because that advisor is going to be the bridge between generations. Uh, the advisor will be there. They'll have conversations with you. They'll know what's important to you. They'll know what you've set out as we want to do X, Y, and Z. We want to accomplish that. They can carry that along as assets. And there is that wealth transition to the next generation. They are there to be that support piece in all of this. Um, there's a question just to, to, to think about as well on top of what does it mean to be you know, my last name? Would you rather your kids have, or whoever your beneficiaries are, would you rather them have your money or your values? And that's a really good way. If you can think about that, how does that guide what my plan is going to look like? Uh, because if it's, if we're focusing more on the, the dollar figures versus kind of the value piece, that's going to be where it's looked at as more transactional. That's where we do fall into that that case more where the money is just going to be spent because it's just money. It doesn't mean anything. It's just money. If we can have values behind it, that's how we set it up and empower the people and causes in our, in our lives for success down the line. And that plan continues on for generations. Andrew and Amanda, I know you've had a lot of experience helping clients navigate these conversations with their families. And so I think a few specific examples may be helpful here for the audience. Um, so what are some common challenging um, challenges that families face um, in their year-end and legacy planning conversations? And how can these challenges be addressed and overcome? So I love using client examples. So I meet with clients and their families. And I had one recently where the daughter knew the parents had a foundation. And the daughter says, I have no desire to run that foundation. My parents have been doing it. They love it. But that's not the way I want to spend my life. So we're already talking about her going to her parents saying, I love that you love giving away, but let's talk about unwinding that foundation and moving it to an advice fund. And the daughter can be named as successor. So when the parents pass away, she can carry on that legacy, same as their parents, but just through a different vehicle. So that was one I recently had. The second one, I had a, an elderly client whose son and I would chat every year and she gave money away at the end of every year. So now he and his mom meet at Thanksgiving. They come to visit the whole family and he sits down with his mom. He says, all right, mom, what do you want to give away and to whom and where? They do it through a donor advice fund. He goes online for her and he knows when he inherits that donor advice fund, it basically becomes his own donor advice fund. He knows what his mom's been giving to and he has a kind of a list and he has a record online and he'll try to continue that legacy for his mom. So those are two good examples I had of how parents have been able to shift down to their children. Yeah. And there's other issues with, you need to have open communication as part of all this. Uh, you, you don't have to share specific dollar figures if you're not comfortable with that. But there, a family worked with in the past, there was a situation where grandma was giving money. She decided to gift money each year to each one of her three children. Uh, 
And some of them had grandkids, some of them didn't, but she said, I'm going to start gifting money. She met with her advisor and said, hey, from an estate tax perspective, it makes sense to be doing this too. So she, she decided she's going to give those dollars away each year. She gave some funds to each daughter, I'm sorry, each child. And uh, first child said, thank you, appreciated it. And they went on their way. The second child did not respond, just took the money and walked off. And the third, there was some discord there because they thought, well, maybe mom is trying to use this to hold it against us in some way. So just by opening up and saying, hey, you know, I want you all to have this gift this year. I want you guys, I want to see you guys enjoy it. I want to see you guys use it. You don't have to say it's for tax purposes. And though maybe if your family is very fiscally inclined, they may like that even more. But I just want to see you all use this and enjoy it and, and, and see how it benefits you all. So just keeping that line of communication open really helps smooth over some of these challenges. Um, there, there are oftentimes you hear concerns about, I don't want to set up my kids to be entitled or I don't want if I keep giving to them. And you can set it up. There are ways to have conversations around that to say, this is not a every time thing. This is going to be a one-off. But matching that philanthropic part of it helps with that piece as well. Some people say, I'm, I don't want my kids to start thinking about my death. And that's fine. That's a valid concern. We hear that quite a bit. Um, and you don't have to approach it in that manner. It's just, here's what's going to happen into the future, going further, going on from here. Uh, we all know we're all going to pass at some point, but we can approach this in a way of this is we're talking about how we can still be with you, even if our body is not here, how we're still with you as part of this legacy. Um, and we do also have questions, you know, there are blended family concerns. You know, maybe you're on your second marriage, you each have children of your first marriage. How do we take care of the plan to make sure that everybody is still treated in, in an equal way or the right way? And that's something where you do need to have these conversations and un, be on the same playing field about what do we want to uh, what do we want to do to take care of this plan? That's where you really need some structure. You need to have those rules set out so that everything happens in the right way uh, down the line. Great. Well, thank you, Andrew and Amanda, for your comments today. We do have a couple questions that have come through the question and answer channel. Um, so first, Andrew, this question, a client is inquiring as to what are the ages where a charitable lead annuity trust or a charitable remainder trust would be preferred or recommended? And so on those, there's it, it depends on the term that might be set on the trust. If it's a lifetime trust, you have to think about the income level you set on it and uh, what the, the IRS tables look like. There's there's a lot of calculations that go into this. There's some rules that the IRS says this has to have X amount of value left in it by the end for this to work. Um, so that's something with that. We looked at that example earlier. That's something we can look at on a client by client basis and help you all and give some guidance there. Uh, generally speaking, the younger you are, if you're looking at doing one of these, at least on the, the, the remainder side, uh, the lower that income level needs to be uh, if we're looking at setting it for life. That's a general rule of thumb to keep. On the lead trust, it's a little different. There's some different tools to pull on and levers to pull on to see what it looks like. Next, Amanda, we have a question um, regarding gifting appreciated stock. So a client is inquiring as to whether or not um, she can gift um, appreciated stock to her son for higher education and avoid paying tax. So is the gift then taxed on her son's basis or is it entirely tax-free like EDU IRA 529 plans used for education qualified expenses? I'll start out with that. I'll maybe have Andrew piggyback. I mean, I've had clients who, who give low basis stocks to their kids. And the reason being the kids are at a lower tax rate. So that is one way to shift that over to the kids. As far as gifting it, Andrew, I'll let you kind of follow up with that. Yeah. So if we're gifting the stock, um, your basis is going to carry over with that. Uh, and then if it's used for educational purposes, there's still going to be a tax realization event at that point, because you're going to have to sell it to pay for the, the educational expenses. Um, there's not really a way to avoid the tax on, on that capital gain piece uh, there. Okay. And then last but not least, we have one final question. Um, and this is to clarify, um, can you direct a required minimum distribution to one's donor advised fund? Good, very good question. You cannot. That's the one rule the IRS said. You have to have it go directly out to a charity. It can't even come in your hands. It goes mailed directly to charity. It cannot go to your donor advice fund. Very good point. Okay. 
And, and just another point on that, the Secure Act 2.0 did change a few things. And one of them is you can set up a, you can do a one-off required distribution uh, up to $50,000 to a charitable remainder trust to set up a new charitable remainder trust. Um, but from what we talked about earlier, for, from an economical standpoint, it really doesn't make sense uh, to do something for that small of a figure. If you think about, I'm going to get 5% on that uh, each year. At 50000 you're not getting a lot of benefit out of there. Uh, and the charitable deduction you get is going to be minuscule as well. So it really doesn't make sense to, to take advantage of that, that provision of the law. Okay, great. Well, thank you for all of your questions today.